actually didn't work out so well for me because I have a I have a, a meeting for my school tonight at 9.30, so I have to end a little bit uh, abruptly. So I want to pause that ahead of time. People have any questions they want to ask if you don't get a chance to speak about, I'm happy to uh, organize an, another time when we can talk to try and uh, flesh out some more of these things. But I also uh, want to thank Rabbi Allen for this opportunity. I, I, don't, I don't know many of you, but uh, I have had experience speaking with uh, Rabbi Allen's uh, students and have always been, um, you know, had the, it's always been a, a very, uh, a very uh, uplifting experience to have the opportunity to teach you because you're so well uh, developed already by, uh, by Rabbi Allen. But we'll get into the uh, topic uh, because we are a little bit short on time again. I apologize for the abruptness. Just pretend I said some funny joke and we laughed and we all got, we all got, we got through that part. But we're going to go right into the into the material here. Um, Rabbi Allen is quite interested in this consumer aspect. I'm only going to get to it at the very end. Uh, but we will, I think I will be able to show how this uh, really is quite relevant to our discussion. So basically we want to, we want to talk a little bit about the- Rabbi uh, Kagan, I, yeah. I just want to know, we want to dedicate the shir in memory of Jason Ruchleimer, who is, uh, Rachel just joined us on the call. So the shir is in memory of uh, Jason. Great, okay. Thank you. All right, so it should be Ilui uh, Nishmaso. Thank you. But what, what we're going to be talking about tonight is obviously the three weeks. The three weeks are a part of our calendar. Whenever you're discussing some, anything to do with the calendar, uh, it's always helpful to um, put things into their larger context. And uh, I, I find myself when I'm speaking, I, I often spend more time talking about the context than the actual uh, specific, but I think actually that is a way of opening up the topic on a much deeper level. So let's get to it for a second. So uh, basically, um, as a part of the calendar, uh, we have to recognize that when we are dealing with the calendar at all, we're not dealing with anything which would, should be considered an incidental part of our Vodas Hashem. If we go back to uh, Sefer Shmos, really the birth of the Jewish people, the first mitzvah that we were commanded in, everybody knows it's also from the first Rashi and Chumash, first mitzvah is the mitzvah of Rosh Chodesh. And that myth that 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 which that myth which really inaugurates us into the service of a Kurdish bar. If I think somebody's mic is still on, but the um, yeah, whoever that is, that's your mic. Um, but the uh, you just want to be careful if we don't mic, if we don't meet these mics, we're gonna we're gonna have problems here. Are we together? Yeah, you're showing us the water jug. Here. Whoever's got the water jug, whoever's showing a water jug is, uh, all right, whatever, I'm gonna keep going. Just please, uh, please be, cut. Please be uh, considerate about the mics. Uh, but the, uh, we were born as, an, our first mitzvah is the mitzvah of Rosh Chodesh. Rosh Chodesh, uh, there's a certain convenience to it in the fact that uh, we need to bring the Korban Pesach, so we need to know the date of the holiday, obviously. But, um, but even, but more than that, uh, what we do with Rosh Chodesh is we are really uh, inaugurate our, so we enter into a new, relationship with time. Uh, and that relationship with time is ordered by the, by the Moedim, by the Chagim, the whole thing of the lunar calendar without even going to the aspects of the lunar calendar, but we enter into a framework of time which is really defined by the Moedim. The word Moed, for the, once upon a time there was an airline called El Al, uh, so if any of you uh, have fond memories of having ridden on them when they used to fly airplanes, Right when you get bored and you turn on the uh, the when you get tired of all the movies and you turn on the map, so uh, the destination is called the Yad. That's what you're heading towards. And really, the Moadim, the idea of the Moadim is really is exactly this idea that it really sets up a number of points along the way as we're moving towards some kind of a specific Yad, a destination, a goal, or a purpose. And really, the uh, the, the, the whole point is we really, we become <clears throat> a nation to find, <coughs> find, find around moving, moving towards, towards a purpose. That purpose, again, is that the, we can emphasize even further the significance of that to who we are. If we look in, say, for the, in, in Parshas Emor, where we first hear about all the Moadim together, the mitzvah that immediately precedes the discussion of the Moadim is actually the mitzvah of, uh, of Kiddush Hashem. V'nikdashti b'soch b'nei Yisrael is the mitzvah that effectively introduces us into the Moadim. That mitzvah is really sort of, uh, it really kind of defines the whole idea of the mitzvah, is the idea of Kiddush Hashem, that a person is willing to give up their life for a Kiddush Baruch. What they're really talking about is we're not saying that um, 
something is more important. It's like the idea there of being willing to giving up, give up your life rather than do something that's, uh, that's uh, so harmful. The idea there is, is not that the, that, the, that the myth is more important, but rather the whole point is my life only exists for the purpose of connecting to a Kaddish Baruch Hu. And as a result of that, if I'm going to do something which is going to effectively violate my ability to be able to make that relation with the Kaddish Baruch Hu, for that I give up my life. It's not the other things more important, but the whole point is defining that my life is moving towards that goal. That's what my life is all about, this idea of Kiddush Hashem. And the idea of the, the Kiddusha, the idea of Kiddusha is that I'm designated for something, right? The idea in Kiddusha when you're getting married, the Kiddusha is you're designated for the Chassan and then the, the Nesuin is where you actually connect up to them. But the idea of, of Kiddusha is I, am de- I exist for, for something specific. Kiddush Hashem is... The overall is I, I exist for the sanctification of a Kaddish Baruch Hu, but the whole idea is the Moedim themselves are basically the fact that we're moving towards some kind of a destination. The connection between that and Kiddush Hashem is that we have to understand this is definitive of what it is to be a Jew. A Jew is on the move, the Regalim. We're going someplace. We're going towards a destination. We have a purpose. When I was uh, once in Vaya, when, when my, my wife and I were, uh, were the first house parents at Neve Rishalayim, uh, when we were there, there was a, a, a young lady who, uh, 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 who actually came from the wrong side of the tracks in, uh, in Lakewood. Uh, the story is uh, her mother was Jewish, her father wasn't. The story is, is not so much relevant to us, but she used to tell us that, uh, you know, as she hang, hung out with the, uh, with, with the other side of Lakewood, they used to look at the Jews and they always said, why are these people always in such a hurry? They always seem to be going someplace. But that really is something which is, I think, definitive of what it is to be a Jew. We have a purpose, and we're moving towards that. And the purpose also is not just something which is externally imposed upon us. This is really something which is, if you're a healthy person, it's intrinsic to the human condition. This is brought out, famous medrash um, that, uh, well, the psukim tell us that Adam Arishon was, uh, what gave, was given the assignment of naming everything in creation. The medrash tells us, in addition to naming the animals, he also named himself. He named himself Adam, and he explained why he called himself Adam is because he is drawn from the Adama. The Maral asks a famous question, which is, the guinea pigs were also drawn from the Adama. The elephants were drawn from the Adama. Why is it that man should be named after the earth when uh, so many things were drawn from the earth? And the Maral explains because man has an affinity with earth that nothing else has, which is that Earth exists for the purpose of actualizing potential. In other words, you put the seed in the ground and it grows and it can't grow unless you put it in the ground, right? Adam is also an actualizer of potential, right? There's a certain essence within us that, uh, that we have the capability of bringing out and any healthy person has an instinct for the significance of that. Anyone who's raised children or remembers being raised as a child that need to define yourself to really bring out who you are and the enormous satisfaction that we get when we feel like we are, like we're, we're, we are bringing out who and what we are into the world. That's an indication of what it is to be man. And this man is named after this quality that we are like the Adama, meaning we're actualized of potential. This is definitive of the human condition. This is who we are. This is what gives us our name. We are doing something. We have something that we need to be doing. Okay, so we, we're born as a people through a Moadim, right? The Moadim are giving us some kind of a direction. The Moadim in doing this are building on something intrinsic to the human spirit. But what is this? What is the goal? What are we moving towards? So for this, we have Pasek, we have Gemara, we have Mishnah, all saying the same thing. Famous Mishnah in Perkyav is based on a Pasek. Kol Masha Barak Kaddish Baruch Hu Ba'olamo Lo Bra'o Ela Lichvodel. Right? What a Kaddish Baruch Hu created, the created, a Kaddish Baruch Hu only created in his world for the sake of his kavod, brings a pasik, kol anikr bishmi lichvodi barosiv yatsartiv af asisiv. Right? Everything in my world was created for the sake of my kavod. Right? So if we understand that the purpose of the world is somehow to bring out the kavod of a Kaddish Baruch Hu, then we have to understand that when we're giving these moadim, the moadim are somehow that journey towards bringing that covet of Hashem into the world. But again, what does that mean? So I think to a certain extent, when we think, when we read this passage that tells us the Kaddish Baruch created the world for his covet, I think one of the things we think about is like, the world is just an astoundingly beautiful place. 
I mean, if you've ever had the time to, I mean, nowadays, if you've taken the time to look through your, through your computer and travel virtually to various parts of, uh, of the world or the country or whatever it is, it is an astonishingly beautiful world. It's an astonishingly complex world. I think that aspect, which I think is, I think we have a natural appreciation for that. That's not actually striking at the essential point. In a certain sense, if we, when we think about those things, we think about a God creating the world, creating a beautiful world. That's more an idea, I think, of self-actualization. Because the idea of kavod, the term kavod, is really something that takes place in the context of relationships. Kavod is really, we talk about the kavod of Malchus, showing kavod to the king. Kavod is something that one person acknowledges or shows towards another person, right? The, uh, and that's the, the essence of Malchus is effective of kavod is the idea of, I don't know if you want to call it recognition, acknowledgement, right? Uh, you know, one of the things that Moshe Shapiro points out is there's nothing more demeaning than forcing someone or something to show you covered. Because if you force something, someone to show you covered, that means that you don't demand it in your own right. It's not something which is an intrinsic quality of yourself. What that means, therefore, is man essentially must be the, 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 the center point of creation because man is the only one with free will and capable through that free will of recognizing the covet of a Kaddish Baruch Hu, seeing that covet, acknowledging that covet, in other words, recognizing the greatness of a Kaddish Baruch Hu. So if that's what it's all about, we're here to recognize the covet of a Kaddish Baruch Hu. So how does that give us some kind of a direction for understanding of the going somewhere of the Moedim? Where are they taking us? We have to realize here that, uh, that when we talk about recognition, I think when we think about it as saying, you know, I have a realization and intellectual understanding, that's a, I would say that is the, a narrow Western view of the idea of what we might call, even the word acknowledgement is, has the word knowledge in it. So we're kind of stuck linguistically in English with sort of what I might call Western concepts. But the Torah idea of acknowledgement is not acknowledgement with the mind understanding something, but it's really acknowledgement through the self, which means that it has to be a total, I don't even know what term to use, total recognition, total acknowledgement. What does it mean to say that the self recognizes something as opposed to the intellect understanding or recognizing something? So we understand that, uh, that, the, that, that the whole point is what Turd demands of us is not simply that we intellectually recognize the Kaddish Baruch but we need to act on that recognition. There's a recognition, that recognition contains within it certain ideals, certain actions, which we may or may not be able to do, to do so on our own right, what, what the actions that are implicated, some are, some aren't, but recognition doesn't mean that intellectual peace, recognition really means both that intellectual understanding and action. Rav Dessler actually has an amazing piece where he asked the, the famous question, right? What is more important, Torah or mitzvahs? When he asked that question, what he actually means is, what's more important, the an internal sense of connectedness to a Kaddish Baruch Hu, or doing actions that are representative of that? So depending on what your, what, where, where your education is, uh, might determine where you might fall in terms of your assumption about what this means. But Desla says a very interesting point. He quotes the Gemara Rachmana Libaboy, the Torah, Kaddish Baruch Hu, wants your lave. He wants that internal relationship. But, says Rav Dessler, if it doesn't show itself in action, then it means it's not really you. Meaning there's a difference between an idea that I have in my mind, a memory that's stored away, and something which is something of myself. It's a Western model that confuses a human being with his understanding, with his thinking. The Torah model goes way, way beyond that. That's an aspect of who we are, but it certainly does not encompass our totality. The totality of our humanity very much comes in the merging of an internal uh, understanding, awareness, sensitivity, sense, and the fact that we are physical beings. So they, these are both defining dimensions of who and what we are. If I can have an ideal, idea or an ideal that implies an action and I don't act on that, if I'm not compelled to act on the ideal, then it's not an ideal, it's an idea. It's something that's in my mind, it's a thought. If it is of me, then the ideal compels me 
to actualize it into my physical being also, which is also an intrinsic part of who and what I am. It has to show itself in action. So if we understand this idea, this concept of kavod being recognition, but not in the Western intellectual thinking sense, but in a much more total humanity kind of way, the idea of this acknowledgement, the kavod of a Kaddish Baruch Hu, bringing myself to it, is has to involve all of my all of myself all the way down to action. Then when we if we look at it in that way, then I think the idea of the moedim becomes a little bit more transparent to us. What it is that we're trying to achieve there as we go. We have Pesach when we're leaving Mitzrayim, which is really all about this recognition of a Kaddish Baruch Hu. And there's a claim of dedication, right? But it's still, it's still very, we, we really don't have any actions to, to show them with yet. Then we have a journey from there to Kabbalah Satara, where again, we're not really acting. The interesting thing about Kabbalah Satara is not that we don't really get that many mitzvahs on Har Sinai when we think about Shavuos. Shavuos is less about getting the mitzvahs than it is Kabbalah's old mitzvahs. It's accepting upon ourselves the yoke of the mitzvahs. And if you think about all the midrashim that talk about the depth of the experience that we had on our Sinai, which sort of brought this to, brought this, this recognition of a Kaddish Baruch Hu to a depth which was eternal. That the significance of Pesach is really, of, of, of Shavuos, of Har Sinai, is that the depth of insight that we were given penetrated so deep within us that it becomes eternally an internal anchor of our personality. And then as we move beyond the, the acknowledgement of the kingship of the Kaddish Baruch Hu, the acceptance of the obligation to act based on a depth of appreciation of the Kaddish Baruch Hu, we then move towards Sukkot which is a time when we build a home for a Kaddish Bar, which means bring it down into the world. And then Shemini Atzeris is really when, instead of building a home, we really build ourselves into a home. Shemini Atzeris, or Simchas Torah, is the idea that I can make myself a vessel for the actualization of God into the world. In Sukkot, I create an artificial environment where I can live in the world as a physical being in the context and defined around my relationship with the Kaddish Baruch Hu. And then Simchas Torah is I don't need the Sukkah anymore, because I make it a part of itself, I become that vessel and I become that, uh, that, that environment or that medium for expressing Kaddish Baruch into the world. This, so it's a, there's, a, there's a sense of developing self as a being of Kavod Shemayim is basically the way we would understand it in developing these different parts of ourselves. This actually brings us back to, the, uh, to what we were talking about before when we are saying it's not an externally imposed ideal because it really emanates very much from within us. Because when we say that Adam is a being who actualizes potential, and we use that metaphor of like the ground where you put a seed into a physical medium, and in the context of that physical medium, the seed can actualize itself. If we realize what, you know, what metaphorically, what is that referring to in a human being? What is the comparison between the two? But we also have like what we might call a soil. You have a part of ourselves that comes from the Adama, and there is something that's placed in that, and only in the context of that physical environment is it able to actualize itself. And that's talking about the talking about the neshama, right? That's Selam Elokim, right? So when we ask ourselves, what is the deepest potential within ourselves that is crying out to be actualized? What we're really talking about is we're talking about that godliness that is planted within us. And the idea of actualizing that potential is really creating ourselves as human beings, which are expressions of Tzalem Elohim. Um, and which is just another way of saying what we were saying before, that we're vessels of Kavod Shemayim, right? We become living embodiments, personifications of Kavod Shemayim, where we are in our very being, we are, we are, I mean, I, I, I remember I once saw a Mercedes-Benz commercial where it says the highest compliment is when you copy someone else. And then it showed how all the uh, body shapes of various cars were copying Mercedes-Benz. I don't know if I should be mentioning that. I guess Rabbi, Rabbi Allen had to give up his Mercedes when he moved to Israel. But the, uh, but what I'm saying is that we make ourselves into a vessel of Tzalem Elohim. Effectually, effectively, we are emulations of a Kaddish Baruch Hu in the world. That's the highest, co- co- that, that is the highest expression of being Mechabed, a Kaddish Baruch Hu, where we become we become Tzalem Elohim. We embody that Tzalem, the image of God in the world 
um, we're emulating it, we're emulating bringing them down into the world. Effectively, man becomes what we might call the bridge between a Kaddish Baruch Hu and physical reality, right? And this is something we could talk about. This is a whole topic in its own right. But basically, we we live in a physical world. The physical world unto itself is meaningless. What makes the physical world meaningful is that it becomes a medium through which God is expressed in the world through the neshama, actualizes itself in the world. The only being is capable of, of, of knitting these two dimensions of reality together is Adam. We have a neshama, we have a goof. We are of the physical reality and we are of the deepest aspects of that spiritual reality and in merging those two together, developing ourselves, actualizing ourselves around the image of that cell and we become the embodiment of the connection if you want to go back to that original model of Kavach Shemayim, of our, our, orig, our original idea that a Kaddish creates this beautiful, beautiful creation. Yeah, he does create a beautiful, beautiful creation. But what really makes it beautiful is that it actualizes a spiritual reality through it. And that's really Autumn's response. We're the ones who are responsible for making the world a, a world which is beautiful in a meaningful sense, as opposed to just in a, an aesthetic sense. But that actually sort of awakens us to the fact that there are really two defining aspects to this responsibility of Kavod Shemayim. We see it reflected in the Moedim, which is that one is to reach very deeply within ourselves, deep into reality, to engage the depth of existence that lies in potential in the creation of a Kaddish Baruch to reach towards the Kaddish Baruch himself. That's one aspect, the depth. And then the other one is the bringing it out into the world, the actualization of that depth into the world. That's really what it is to be human. That's what it's really all about, right? With the, um, you see that very much reflected in the Moedim when you think about Pesach to Shavuos, where again, the, experience of the of the miracles of Yitzhiya's Mitzrayim of the Exodus really gives us access to an appreciation for the greatness of a Kaddish Baruch Hu, culminating after personal development to a certain extent in Kabbalah Zatara and Har Sinai in, our, in the Sinai experience where the heavens are, are, are shredded to give us access and awareness of all the depth of reality human being is capable of conceiving along with that comes the acceptance of the fact that if you see it and understand that you must act on it, there must be actions, then comes the whole process of receiving the mitzvahs and come the sukkahs. Sukkahs were building Beis HaMikdash as a place to bring Kaddish Baruch into the world, to live in the world in a way that reflects it as a creator. And we spoke about Shemini Atzeris also where I internalize it myself. There are these two aspects, Pesach Shvuas, which comes to a depth of appreciation and then finally, Sukkashmini Atzeres, where I've got to make the physical world a meaningful manifestation of the fact that that depth really exists there. And this, these two poles we see coming up all over the place, right? When man was first created, the, 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 there's, there's, a term, there's a name of God that's called his complete name. It's the Yudke Vavke together with the Shem Elohim, Hashem Elohim. Those two names together are considered what we call the complete name. And the reason for that is the Yudke Vavke really conveys to us the fact that a Kaddish Baruch Hu is the basis of being itself. It's really the deepest appreciation of what God is that we're capable of reaching this world. And to a certain extent, we can't reach there even now, but whatever. But that's the depth. And Elohim is Midas Adin, the way that he conducts the world as a functioning physical, natural reality. Those two terms together, the depth of the fact that there's a source to existence itself that manifests itself in the world, in the functioning of the world, those things called the, the, the complete name. That complete name only appears after the creation of Adam and remains in the Torah only till the end of basically the story of the creation of Adam because as a result of the sin of Adam and Chava, right, the ability to synthesize those two is, uh, is, becomes hidden. But man in himself has the potential for bringing those two together. Fun fact, there's one other place in the Torah where we see those names coming together, Hashem Elohim. We see it in, that, in, the, in the creation story of Adam in the second and the third chapter. This appears completely, appears again in the seventh Makkah, the Makkah of the Barad. 
And other than that, it's nowhere else in the entire Torah. Okay, that's a story in its, its own right in terms of understanding what the significance of the bard is, not to go there now. I'm just saying the idea of mixing together Yudke Vavke, a engaging the very capability of Bri itself and synthesizing it with the functioning of the world, the depth and the expression. We can also see it if we like, we can see it in, in, the, in the split between Yaakov and Esav. We see it in the role of the Navi and the Melech. Interestingly enough, we see it in the signs of Kashrus, right? There are two simonim, there are two signs that make an animal kosher, right? One is that it chews the cud, and the other is that it has a completely split hoof. The completely split hoof means that they don't have a paw, it's not a hunting animal, and the chewing of the cud, one is, a, one is an obvious external sign, meaning I'm not, a, not violent, and one is a hidden internal sign, which it, it basically conveys the idea that my sense of satisfaction, my sense of completeness comes from within me. When I find myself wanting for completion, I don't look external, I look internal. That's really the uh, significance of the chewing of the cud. In order for an animal to be kosher, it, has both of, it needs to have both of these characteristics. It's internally connected, it looks inside rather than outside for satisfaction, and the way it expresses itself externally is it's not a violent, it's, it's, it's not a violent animal that takes life away from others. But I'm just saying we, everywhere we look, we see this dichotomy of what is our purpose? What does it mean to be a Jew? Why was a human being created in the world? We can see it in the modem, we can see it in the nature of our humanity in terms of what's crying out to actualize itself in the world. There's a depth, a connection to a meaningful realm of reality itself, and then the obligation to bring that into the world and make the physical world a place that is manifest, the fact that it has this, uh, this meaningful core to it. That kind of uh, introduced us to the, the realize that um, that's what the Moedim are about. Tisha B'Av is also a Moed. Tisha B'Av is called a Moed. Tisha B'Av is, right, uh, is in, in Eicha, Kara'alai Moed Lishbor Bachurai, that you call, a pa, call out a holiday, a Moed. Well, a holiday is probably not the right word exactly, but certainly a Moed to destroy the youths of Klal Yisrael. It's, a, it's not a pretty image, but it's, not, it's significant that in Eich of the Navi gives it a term moed, right? And that has halakha consequences. It's not, it's not just, it's not, again, Torah is never just, you know, uh, you know, you know, poetic. It's always meaningful. And to call Tisha B'Av a moed is uh, almost, uh, it's almost frightening. But uh, if moed is the idea of destination, so the idea here is that Tisha B'Av also represents a destination in the year. And when we remember that Tisha B'Av is really the completion of something that begins with Shiva Sabatamas, right? It's really what we really, what we have here when we look at this time period of the three weeks, there are many, many different midrashim that make absolutely clear what we're talking about here is not two separate days, but rather a day which initiates a sequence or a process which culminates ultimately in Tisha B'Av. That's, that's the way to look at it. It's like there's a beginning, you can see it, for example, in the in the very first Navua of Yirmiya, of Yirmiyo, right? He's given a, an image of a almond club, club not like club med, but like the kind of club you 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 beat things with, and the image of the club there is what Kachbar is going to come and he's going to be clubbing Klal Yisrael, but the uh, in the Medrash, the, y y y Jeremiah is asked, Yirmiya is asked. You know, what's the significance of the fact that we're told that this club is made out of almond wood? And we're told that it's because almond is the fastest ripening fruit. From the time of the budding of the fruit until you have a mature fruit of an almond, shaked, yeah, sheket, shaked means to be running after something, but it takes 22 days, which is the time from Shavasabatamuz to Tishabav. Ad Bechal, including, including those days. So the imagery there, it, by telling you the 22 days from Shiva Sabatamas to Tisha B'Av are really connected the budding of a fruit and its maturation. 
That's what the Medrash is really telling you. He's telling you that Shivasa Batamas initiates a process which comes to, if you want to call it, fruition in on Tishabav in Chorban Abayas. We're talking about a process of time. In a certain sense, it's like you might call it the opposite of the Moadim in terms of the holidays. The holidays were, bringing, were going from Mitzrayim through to Sukkot and Shemini Atzeres with the whole developmental process of reaching the heights of recognition of a Kaddish Baruch and then bringing it that down into expression in the world. So Tisha B'Av is, is, is kind of, it seems to be the opposite of that, where Shiva, we'll show this in a second, but Shiva Sabatama is, is really the inversion of that quest for a depth and appreciation of a Kaddish Baruch Hu, and then Tisha B'Av represents the, the fact that the world becomes a destroyed place as a place for actualizing or expressing uh, the true meaning, the covet of Shemayim, basically. I mean, there's no, there's no more bazillion. There's no more. Uh, what's the translation of bazillion? There's no more denigration. There's no more gr- the greater denigration of a Kaddish Baruch than Harvin Abayas. So it's really we're leading to the absolute opposite of the covet Shemayim that the world is really about. So this, these three weeks are really should be seen as kind of like a, uh, a uh, we blew it, <laughs> we blew it, and we started ourselves down a path that instead of leading us to Kavad Shemayim is really leading to the Bezoyan of Shemayim. You see this uh, in terms of trying to understand how you put these two together. Uh, if we remember what, you know, what, 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 again, we're doing this really just to try and get an overview of these ideas. We're moving pretty quickly, as you may have noticed. But the, um, but uh, Shivasa Batamas, that was the day on which the, the Ege, we built the golden calf. Um, it's the day on which the walls of the of Yerushalayim were breached. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, whatever without going into it, but the 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 we, we can look at the as as the, the building of the golden calf really is a paradigm for what this day really represents, which was the whole idea of building that egel, the intention of Klon Yisrael in building the egel was to truncate the depth of our connection to a Kaddish Baruch Hu. In other words, the background to it is, you know, Moshe Rabbeinu, we just gone through Kabbalah Zatara, Moshe had gone up to Mount Sinai to, Sinai to, to receive the Luchos, the Torah. And, you know, things were manipulated so that the, the Jewish people thought Moshe was dead, right? And they had what they ended with, they, they, they justified themselves as they, they saw themselves having a problem, right? That, uh, that, that the relationship with the Kaddish Baruch Hu from the time that Moshe Rabbeinu had become the leader of the Jewish people was characterized by the complete abrogation of the natural world. They were living on a completely supernatural level. And it was really, uh, it was a stretch. It was a stretch. And it really, the, the degree of the stretch is really demonstrated by what happened on Har Sinai, which is when the Kaddish Baruch Hu revealed himself so it was so overwhelming that the that everyone died and had to be brought back to life. In other words, the neshama was like I, again. I, don't, I admit this is not really the best of images, but it works for me. If you remember from a bug's life, Walt Disney's a bug's life. The the mosquitoes being attracted towards the purple, you know, mosquito light. But I, whatever I don't know. Maybe it really doesn't do. Hard. Maybe it's that's not hard night for you, but it's always hard night for me. Anyway, the idea that Kaddish Baruch reveals himself on the level that the neshama is just drawn out. You have to get close. You can't even stay in the body anymore. So when they died, had to be brought back to life. Died again, brought back to life, and then they basically said, "Okay, Moshe, this has really been fun. You get the rest of them, and you'll give them to us." Right? The the, the depth of revelation of a Kaddish Baruch Hu was overwhelming, and the Jews got into their heads. This is not a, a this is more of a justification than motivation, but they they justified that they could they could handle this level of revelation as long as Moshe was there to be an intermediary for them. And they thought Moshe was gone. The building of the golden calf was actually an effort to dumb down the level of God's relationship with creation and me, mediate it more through what we call Midas Adin rather than the miraculous Midas Achesa that really characterized the relationship uh, from the birth of the Jewish people. And you see that in the choice of a calf. I don't know if you've ever been hiking out in the desert in Eretz Yisrael and your tour guide had an epileptic seizure and suddenly your cell phones all went dead. So, you know, what, what are you going to do? The obvious thing, obviously, is to collect all of your jewelry 
and make a golden calf because that will solve all of your problems, right? So you know, if you're trying to understand what, you know, the, the fact that they built the calf is very significant. So the calf represents, the, it's, 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 it's basically a bull. It's a young, why it's a baby bull that's a, that we don't have to go into, but it's a bull. And the point is that the bull was the animal that was the intermediary between man and the natural world because the bull was the, the animal that pulled the plow. All of our relationship to nature was mediated through the bull. And that imagery of the bull represents uh, the natural world, relating to reality through the natural world. And that's the reason why the image of the bull in the, in the vision of the Merkava, of the highest levels of understanding, the vision of a bull is on the, is, is, we're told is on the left side of the Merkava. Left is always associated with the idea of Midas Adin. Midas Adin is structured reality as opposed to the sort of infinite possibilities of chesed and miracle. Midas Adin is really the natural world. And building a golden calf was really attempting to funnel the relationship with the Kaddish Baruch Hu through natural reality rather than the miraculous supernatural reality that they had been experiencing up until there. They're really trying to cut down the depth of a Kaddish Baruch Hu's relationship with the world. And it results in the destruction of the luchos, of the Torah, in our connection to these, these really, these incredible depths that really give a sense of meaning to the world. This is, it's, it's, it's the undoing of the journey from Mitzrayim to Kabbalah Satara. We'd, we'd heard the, the Eser Dibros, they were, they were supposed to culminate in receiving the, in the, the tablets. Those tablets were destroyed as around the, the Egel because the building of the Egel was the direct contradiction of everything that Sinai represented, which is reaching for the true depths where we engage a Kaddish Baruch in some meaningful way, transcending the physical natural world for our definition and our meaning, and instead building this ego, which was trying to return us to a natural experience of the world and losing that connection to the true depths. So Shivasta Batamos is for us a day which is, we turned our backs on that project of depth, meaning, significance, right? Engaging reality on a level that, that takes us beyond physical reality. And uh, that's the significance of Shiva Sabatamas for us, where we, we embrace the natural world as defining reality itself for us. That decision, I mean, again, we did tshuva for it, but it's clear that the tshuva is not complete on some level. This, you know, this comfort with the natural world that we can control, yeah, is, leads us down a path which will eventually culminate in what happened on Tisha B'Av. In Tisha B'Av, in the desert, what happened was, was the Jews turned their backs on Eretz Yisrael. The, the, the understanding of what was really going on over there was the was the fact that they were, they were sent into a world which is a natural world for the, first, for the first time, and it was their job to remember that a Kaddish Baruch was running it. They'd been in the desert this whole time where everything was miraculous. Miraculum is when you're going to go into a natural world, and now the Kaddish are you able to see that as an expression of God's oversight, or are you going to fall into relating to it as a natural world? It was the ego we chose to understand the world naturally. We did shuva on that. But now the real test is, am I, can I live in the world, in a natural world, and see through that to the deep rashkach of a Kaddish Baruch that he's running the world? And the Meraglim went in. They couldn't do it. They came back and said, we'll never get in there. The cities are fortified all the way to Shamayim. There's no way to get in. Like, well, hello, what happened to you? Like, God just got through cremating all in its time. What's the problem? If you can recognize a Kaddish Baruch was the one who's running the world, then you understand that nature is nothing more than a medium through which you engage a Kaddish Baruch they couldn't do it. They lost the ability to do that. And that was, that was the, again, so Tisha B'Av really is the, in a, the a lack of sufficient motivation, energy to connect that meaningful reality that we're able to see on an understanding level to make it part of the world that we're living in. Going back to what I said about Rav Dessler. Rav Dessler is you got to have the idea and it has to be so much a part of you that you're compelled to actualize it in the world. So Torah is the depth of the vision, and we, we need to be the point where we're compelled to see a Kaddish Baruch Hu's oversight in the physical world, that oversight that we come to appreciate through the Torah, we need to make it part of our world, and we didn't do it then, and basically, ultimately, that leads to Horban Abayas, the, the destruction of the base of Mikdash. 
Whew. Okay, let's quickly see if we can get get to the get to the part that that, that Rabbi Allen was really hoping for. Um, we find ourselves when, when, as as we're experiencing the three weeks now. We have to understand everything is being framed for us through the fact that we find ourselves now in modern Western society, which is a direct extension of Rome, the fourth of the four kingdoms, the four exiles that the Jewish people have experienced. Each one of them had their characteristic. But uh, Chazal made clear that when you talk about the first exiles of the Jewish people, the first three really, Babel, Persia, even Greece, those were exiles where meaning was essential. There may have been a corruption in what that meaning was, but all those societies defined themselves around meaning, meaning Babel and Persia were idolatrous, meaning they were idol worshiping, but they were worshiping societies. They may have corrupted the worship, but they were worshiping, meaning they were trying to connect themselves to a reality that transcends the physical world. And Greece also in its own way, although it was a more intellectual version of it, the Greeks were into in the intellect, understanding and meaning. The Romans were distinct from the Greeks. And again, this is really what connects our exile. The Romans were materialists. They really lived in the material world. What was real for them was the physical material existence we find ourselves in. And that is very much the world that we're living in today. A world was ultimately cut off from the concept of meaning, right? That is what our world, we are convinced that what is really real is the physical, the material, and everything else is commentary. Okay, so you want to be religious. You don't want to be religious. You're Jewish. You're a different one. That's your interpretation. It's fine. It gives your life meaning. That's nice. What's real is the material world, and then the rest is however you want to do it. However you want to deal with it, that's your business. But the fact that that should be definitive of what reality is about, meaning is what the world is, and the material world is nothing more than an actualization of that, that's something that is very, very far away from us in the world that we're living in. And that's what the Torah is all about. And the truth is, in their own way, those earlier exiles were also, they were, each one had a corruption. But the, that idea that meaning was definitive reality as opposed to material expression, what's unique about the world we live in is it's not like that. We look at the material as being real. That's where, we, that's where reality is anchored for us. And the, we're, we're pretty far down the line at this point. I mean, it's gotten really extreme. Like, uh, you know, the, it was a big, Darwin was a big Kiddush. Because when Darwin came along, it became very difficult for human beings to distinguish themselves from animals. But we live in a time where we can't even dis 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 distinguish ourselves from inanimate objects. We can't distinguish ourselves from a silicone chip, right? A person can write a computer program, which is, which are, is not, maybe you can distinguish it from a human being with a great deal of difficulty. What's really interesting is many people prefer to relate to the computer program rather than to a real human being. It's like, uh, there's a lot of studies on this. It's, it's, a, fr it's a frightening world that's on its way in terms of like, like uh, robots that are being designed to be caregivers, whatever. And that, I'm not going into this whole thing now. There's a lot of books on this stuff. You don't need me for this. You want a good book about it, there's, uh... oh, whatever. I have to I don't remember the title right now. But the, the, there's a lot of stuff on this now. This is not my chiddish, but it's, uh, in terms of putting it in this context, I think it's, it, I think it's, it's helpful is that, we become so materialistic that we can't even distinguish our humanity from, inanim from inanimate objects. And in fact, we find people preferring to relate to a computer or a robot rather than to actual people because there's no responsibilities. It's easy. One of the places where you see this confusion coming out is we said before that what it is to be human is to have an innate sense of the need to develop to complete yourself, to actualize, right? That's the way a human being is built. And what you're supposed to be actualizing is that cell melochim. That's what's implanted in you. But we live in a world where we're so disconnected from it, we, we, we identify reality with the physical to the point where, tell me if I'm wrong, this is me, and maybe it's just me, but like, we love to fix our physical environment. We are fixated on buying things and buying things that we don't need. We don't know we don't need them. We think that's what we need. And then we, as soon as we buy it, we, don't, we never use it. We go looking for the next thing to buy. The reason is because we're so entrenched in physical reality that instinct for development and completion has been directed into our physical environment, right? We, we're always, as a kid, you do this all the time. You, like, you spend all kinds of time 
getting your room exactly perfect, then you go out and play someplace else because you, you, you're more interested in making that physical place perfect than in actually having a purpose to use it for something. We, we, we justify our fixation on getting things just right because then we'll be able to use it in, for the right thing and we never get around to using it because we're really much more interested in fixing the, fixing the physical environment. We're so fixated, we're so implanted in that, we're so far away from that, from that spiritual dimension that when, we, when that instinct for human development expresses itself, it gets directed into our physical environment rather than meaning and purpose. And I find that very much with myself. I don't know where, uh, I don't know, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm, 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 I'm alone in that, but I don't think so. Uh, and when you think about it, in the, I, 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 I eventually came to, I'm not, I don't know if I'm allowed to mention this, but the, you know, there's a vision in the matrix before Neo you know, decides to take, I don't know what he chooses between the blue pill and I don't know which one was which, whatever, but he's shown a picture of what the world really looks like. You know, he, he, we have this built up world that we see, but what the world really looks like is, is something completely destroyed. We're in a very funny, a, a, a quirkily similar situation where we know exactly what the world looks like. We don't know what the world's supposed to look like. And if we knew what this world was supposed to look like, we would appreciate the world that we see as we see it is actually a destroyed world. Because we are so far away from that 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 anchor in that spiritual dimension. I got to go, but I want to finish off with one. I apologize. I just I, I have a meeting that was that was that was an emergency meeting. I had to set up after even after Rabbi Man Alan had asked me to do this, but I want I want to end off with an image, which is that the height of the Kharban in when the first temple was destroyed. Fine, the temple was destroyed. But the Gemara tells us that when the Babylonians went in and pulled the Aaron out of the Kodesh Kedoshim, the Kruvim, the angels on top of the, of the, of the Aaron were embracing. And that was, that was considered a nace, an, a nace for Ra. That's the way the Rishonim refer, referred to it. Because the embrace of the Kruvim is supposed to demonstrate the intimate relationship between a Kodesh Baruch Hu and his world through the Jewish people, right? And since this was a moment when the Jews were far away from a Kaddish Baruch Hu, the embrace of the Kruvim demonstrated that a Kaddish Baruch Hu's intimate relationship with reality was indifferent to the Jews. It's like what, what the, the image there was that we'd been pushed out of our position as being the medium through which a Kaddish Baruch Hu connected to physical reality. That was the incredible bazillion, the denigration of the Jewish people, the deep denigration of the Jewish people that took place through this harbor. But interestingly, is that, is that clear? Did I, did I say that too fast or can I go on? Rabbi Allen, are we good? Say it again. Maybe just a, a, a one minute piece recap. The Kruvim themselves, one represents the Kaddish Baruch Hu and one's supposed to represent the Jewish people. What really de- represents is the world as the Kaddish Baruch Hu embraces it. It's supposed to be through the Jewish people. And the embrace of them represents the closeness of that relationship. And when we're not doing so well with one another, the Kruvim turned away from one another. But here at this moment of destruction, where clearly the Jewish people are far away from the Kaddish Baruch Hu, the Kruvim come out hugging one another. The nations of the world understood what that meant was that God is intimately connected to his world and indifferent to the fact that the Jews are not part of the relationship. Like we'd been pushed out as the nation that were the medium through which a Kaddish Baruch was connecting to physical reality. But there's a deeper meaning here, which is ultimately the Jews saw a deeper meaning, which was, yes, it's incredibly embarrassing, but he's still hugging us. He's still hugging us, which is that what it means there is that the destruction that was taking place is part and parcel of a process of rebirth. We say that, you know, the Chazal tell us that the Mashiach is born on Tisha B'Av. Seems like a strange enough thing, right? This is the day, our lowest day, our day when the Kaddish Baruch's presence in the world seems to be, have been shattered is the day when the Mashiach is, is created. So the Maral explains in many, many places that the rebirth represented by Mashiach is, represents a completely new reality and it can only come into the world once the old reality is no longer there, right? A seed can only grow into a tree when it ceases being a seed. It has to stop. Right? The whole idea of tshuva is that I have to stop, the embarrassment of tshuva is I have to stop being the person I was so I can become something new. 
what precedes a rebirth, a reemergence of something new, is the removal of what was. So this Corbin of bias means that we brought ourselves to the point where the nature of the relation that we'd had up until that po point was no longer had a path forward, the ultimate goal of the Kavod Shemayim, that's the purpose of the world and our purpose through the Moadim and through, through Jewish history. What that means, that brings a destruction, not a total destruction, a destruction of that path because that path has to be destroyed in order that a new path can emerge. Jewish history is always a process of, we're trying to get where we need to get to. If we bring it to a point where we can't get it there this way, then this way has to go out the window to make room for a new way. And that's been Jewish history over and over again. You see us trying all the way to the first debate for the destruction of the first temple, leading to the building of the second temple, the destruction of the second temple, and then the process that we're in now, which ultimately leads to the building of the third temple, whatever. But the bottom line is always a destruction which leads to a rebirth, but a rebirth in a completely different form from the original one, right? The original relationship when we left Mitzrayim was characterized by prophecy and miracle. Second temple was through Chachma and Torah Shabal Pet, right? So each one of these relationships are different forms of forming relationship. As we move towards Tisha B'Av, I want to focus on sort of where the destruction lies in the world that we're in is our complete infatuation with physical, with the material world. You know, obviously we think we try to have meaning and stuff like that, but if we really think deeply about who we are and where we're at, we would really, how deeply committed we are to the reality of physical and material, material world. And the fact that obviously we're all working on it, we're trying these things, but there's a, there's a sense in which uh, that materiality takes, takes, it takes a front seat. And Tisha B'Av is sort of the culmination of where that leads to, which is, that's not Kavod Shemayim. You can't have Kavod Shemayim with such a thing. Because the physical will always never be more than a medium of expression rather than the locus of meaning for reality. But Tisha B'Av also, as we see where that can lead to, and again, we, we, it's for each one of us to build our own lives in a different direction. But even when we recognize that destruction, we recognize that destruction, that destruction comes through a, an embrace of a Kaddish Baruch Hu because it's ultimately the next step. We brought ourselves to the point where this is the only path forward, but it's a path forward. Kaddish Baruch Hu brings the destruction in the form of an embrace because it is the process by which that relationship is reborn as we create a new relationship with the Kaddish Baruch Hu. Again, so you think of Eretz Yisrael, right? The, Chor, the, the Holocaust was a Chorban, but what emerged out of that was a whole new relationship, all the potential, the new kind of potential represented by the fact we find ourselves in Eretz Yisrael today. We have a living representation of all the potential that lies in a Tisha B'Av. We saw, we, 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 the, 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 the Chorban of, of, of that Tisha B'Av is a, is a living, still painful memory for us, but we've been around long enough to see how that, that, that destruction came through an embrace that ultimately leads to a whole new incarnation of the relationship with the Kaddish Baruch with all this potential for a new kind of connection to him. I apologize, I got to run. I got I got another meeting in four minutes, but I'm happy to come back on another time if you want to, to answer questions or take these things a little bit deeper. Sorry about the timing here. Okay, Rabbi Kagan, we thank you so much. We really appreciate it. And uh, so you'll, you'll, you'll stick around to, you again. You'll, you'll, you'll stick around to answer the questions. So if, if, you, if you want to try and get back can, to that. But uh, we'll try. <laughs> Thank you okay, so much. Okay, thank you so much. I apologize Maybe for running off. All the best. Take care. Okay, bye-bye. It's nice to meet uh, you all. Bye-bye. Um, I'm just going to be clear. I'm not answering any questions. So uh, I've got to kind of digest everything that I've just heard, <laughs> as as usually. Now, I mean, I can attempt to answer some questions, but I don't think I... I will. I saw that Sam had a, Shmuel had a question um, in the beginning. I have, I have more questions than that as well. <laughs> so we're going to have to bring him back and just, it'll be a Q&A session with him. Yeah, Shmuel? You, that, that's fine. You can attempt, you can attempt to answer it if you want. I can attempt. I mean, I, I don't know if I'll be successful, but uh, I, I have an, I have another a bigger question on the materialism and anti-materialism. Sure. I mean, in general, I mean, we you know, we say, we say that the Chumash doesn't mention Olam Abba, for example. I mean, you read the Chumash; it talks about inheriting the land. You read the Gemara, and I mean, any internet filter would knock out half of it. It's all about relationships between men and women and business that that's almost that's, that's probably 70 percent of of gamara you know 
it's it's not it's not any any you know deep spiritual delving it's like very very focused on physical world we're saying like we shouldn't be i mean it's if you're if you're a good jew you're very very focused on the nitty gritty of every little thing and it's almost it's almost nothing on you know kavana you know meditation this is just not you know you'd have to you have to learn you know unusual books to get there um, so you ask an excellent question. It's something that's definitely discussed uh, by Rabbi Kagan and many others. And I think the idea is that we have these two facets of the Masorah, of the tradition that we're given. We have the written, and then we have the oral tradition. So the written tradition, you know, and all these different halachot and everything that you've mentioned, certainly focuses on how we're supposed to act in the material world. And that is the application of all the spirituality. If a person is all spiritual, so on and so forth, but that's not applied to the physical world, then they've kind of missed the boat. So I'm going to propose that the tradition that comes hand in hand with what you've described, the application to the material world, the tradition is that I view myself and all of these things from a spiritual perspective. In other words, one can view themselves and all of the things that they deal with as being spiritual and also having a physical counterpart. In other words, it's like when I relate with another person, what do I see? Do I see their body or do I see their soul, right? So we have to treat them well with their, their specifics in terms of how we're supposed to act and what we're supposed to do. The question is, how do I look at that? Do I look at helping my friend as an opportunity and something that I want to do and something that is spiritual? Or do I look at it as a burden and something I don't really want to do, but I have to do it because that's what I'm supposed to do? So I think it's a matter of perspective, right? How do I view the situation? And based on what Rabbi Kagan was saying is, we view it and we view ourselves from a spiritual perspective that has to be applied in the physical. Uh, very much like the matrix metaphors that, but by the way, I've never heard him make matrix metaphors. So that was like, uh, that was like, uh, I'm going to have to grill him afterwards. I mean, that. even, even in the Gemara, I mean, let's take, take Sukkot for example, right? Like you, you can read all of Masechet Sukkot and it's like, you know, you talk, your whole focus is on millimeters. And, yep. and, and one of, one of, one of the 60 days that you learn it would be like something in depth. And the rest of it would be like, you know, we're talking about boards here. This is uh -huh. what, this is, this is the topic under discussion, boards and roofs and walls. You know, that's, that's the oral tradition. It's, it's, it just doesn't seem focused on so, so so if we're building it seems focused on physicality structure which is meant to act as a spiritual channel then all those things matter in other words within chemistry within biology you know just take a couple of things in and out and you've got a completely different situation in computers and programming you know so on and so forth a couple of zeros in a couple of ones out so on and so i mean we are spiritual art architects but we recognize that the physical is the realm in which we exercise these you know spiritual principles and therefore every detail every minutia is is important vis-a-vis -vis the end goal so i think what his message was is exactly your question the message was with when we do these physical things we have to always bear in mind the kavanot the spiritual underpinning of them and not lose that because once we lose that, we're just going through all the motions and doing all this by road, we've completely missed the point. We've completely missed the boat of, of what the purpose is. Yeah, that, that I agree with. In other words, it's not less materialism, so to speak. It's, it's more purpose. It's a, a, a hyper understanding of how the material is important and relevant to the spiritual. Correct. So it's, it's not, but it's not necessarily, uh, go ahead. Oh, sorry, I don't want to take up. Yeah, if, if I can interject, I think there's also um, about kind of like the chicken and the egg, like does the spiritual, does the spiritual essence come first or the physicality comes first? 
So in the example of the sukkah, you know, we're learning with the intention that we're building the sukkah as a physical manifestation of, you know, God's presence. Whereas I think in today's world and the politics of things going on today, it's kind of like the reverse of like how all comes, all spirituality comes from the physical and not the other way around. So I think there's something to say about that as well. Uh, so we'll, we certainly should continue on this uh, theme. I think next week I'll actually attempt to teach. Um, and then the following week, with your permission, I would love to bring uh, Reb Gedalia Gerfine, my mentor who taught me how to teach, uh, among other things, and talk about uh, this People's Talmud project. Uh, also, I did ask uh, Rev Beasley about giving his uh, archaeology and the Bible uh, session, which is absolutely fascinating, and I'm waiting to hear back from him. So we've got a great lineup, and uh, as always, if anyone wants to talk, just private message me, and I would be uh, very happy to set up a meeting time. And uh, thanks so much. I wish everyone a meaningful and easy fast and uh, a wonderful week. Stay safe and be well. And great to see you, Lewis. So you guys have two screens now. <laughs> All right, take care, Shmuel. Bye-bye, Jonathan. Okay, bye, guys. Bye, Sam and Lewis. Bye, Rachel. Bye, Biana. Bye, Nikoma. Bye, Ben. Bye. Nikoma, can we get like just a, a, a Macho Man, Randy Savage ending? Oh, yeah. Well, you know, brother, we got to get it ready for the fast and the two spot of the destruction and annihilation so we can bring it all back again for us. Dude, that's just too good. You need to apply to be his like uh, voiceover or, or, or double or something like that, man. Epic. Never know. Beautiful. All right. Thanks so much, Nikoma. All the best, man. Take care. Bye. Okay. Peace, everyone. Take care.